All right, uh, friends and allies, we're going to kick off with a poem by Adam Gottlieb, and then we'll get started with our program. Come all you good people, good news to you I'll tell Of how the revolution will make heaven out of hell Which side are you on? Which side are you on? How many lives we say That we all fought for something more than to keep on being slaves Now tell me which side are you on? Which side are you on, mother trucker? Which side are you on? Which side are you on? And the statue of Columbus Downtown on Columbus Drive Cops beat and tear gas us protecting that monument to genocide Now which side are you on? 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 Which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? We're from the freedom side! Which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? We're from the freedom side! Poverty, why would we need police when food is scarce? Prisons are plenty, but without justice, there's no peace. Now, which side are you on? 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 Tell me, which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? We're on the freedom side. Which side are you on, my people? All right, welcome everybody. Yeah, yeah, that was Adam Gottlieb uh, of uh, One Love performing Which Side Are You On? And I uh, thank you for giving him props. Um, okay, thank you, thank you. All right, so my name is Jesu Estrada. I will be your moderator. I'm a member of the League of Revolutionaries for a New America, like many of the comrades here. And today we have a very timely and excellent program regarding uh, education and the title is Education Under Attack. And I just wanna contextualize with this brief quote from an article, we're gonna post a link to it, um, but I, I think it does a really great job of framing why we're here, right? A lot of us and says, there has never been a more momentous time to redefine public education. Powerful forces intend to dismantle public schools and are launching a broad political attack this is an issue that will cripple all of society if we allow it to proceed, nor has there ever been a more important historical moment for young people to fight for a society that includes their leadership. And I think that that is really on point, especially um, the role that the youth are, have been taking and need to take you know, in, this, in this struggle. And so we're going to start. Um, thank you, thank you. Just getting some amazing speakers we have today with us. Kathy Powers, Kathy Powers, and I hope this sound is working well. Uh, Kathy Powers is, she works at the help desk at the People's Tribune and is a very active member of the People's Response Network to COVID-19. Uh, and she embraces questions about COVID issues in schools. Uh, Kathy, do you wanna start us off? You have to unmute sister. There you okay. go. Can you hear Perfect. me? Beautiful, we can hear you just fine. Okay. I have to turn off the. I have to turn off the sound on my computer. Or I get feedback. Can you hear me well? You sound really good. No. You're good. Can you hear me now? 
Yes, we can hear you just fine. It's good. It's good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I I have to maneuver here to do this. I wanted. I really wanted to start about uh, the general attack on uh, public education, com coming from uh, Alec, the American Legislative Exchange Council. And uh, these, these are the leaders in the dark money uh, business. And they are the ones, they have, they have their uh, own agenda. And, and their agenda is to keep the people dumb. Keep the people dumb. So they've been attacking public education forever and a day. And during Trump's, Trump's uh, administration, uh, of course, we had Betsy DeVos, who, you know, he, he, it has an incredible foundation. Oh, my God. You should see how big it is. Uh, in the chat, I'm putting in a link to the members of uh, ALEC. It may not be updated because I noticed on the web that a lot of the the information is not not very well dated, but it'll just give you an idea of uh, who these people are. Uh, now, here we go. It's a chat now. You can read all about these monsters, and what they what they've been doing is uh, uh, purposely purposely uh, starting public schools. Uh, they aggressively have pushed voucher programs, and they 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 call on states to uh, transform the system. Don't tweak it. In other words, you know it's an assault on on the whole public school system. Uh, my my sources are from the Nation. From uh, there was a very interesting post on the internet about a. Um, I'm looking for here, a Wisconsin state representative in 2017 uh, post posted a uh, a link. Uh, he po he posted an actual reporting of when he went to. There it is. Um, this is hard. <laughs> I'm not used to using my phone. I I apologize. Um, this was in 2017, but nothing has nothing has changed. In fact, the uh, the because of the the problems we're having with the economy and capitalism and the horrible pandemic that we've had that we still have. It's not over. Biden made a big mistake there. Um, and and what what they what they've done now, but besides starving the money of schools, which they've done, and promoting charter schools that get public money for pri private uh, schools, you know that 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 was the deal until the pandemic. And now what they've done in the pandemic, at least they have in Chicago. I can only speak for what I see. They have actually. Not supplied schools with toilet paper, with soap, which are like and masks. Of course, are masks, and they haven't promoted masking very much, and now they're not promoting masking at all. And last month, last month, the statistics were over four thousand new COVID cases in the Chicago public schools. Now that doesn't. <laughs> That's just not acceptable at all. And because there are no mitigations involved, the uh, uh, vaccine rate is like, like for the new vaccine, it's like under 2%. So, you know, there are no mitigations at all. And we are victims, victims of this pandemic. The rich people can get what they need healthcare wise, and we can't. And really, you know, they're, they're trying to kill us. The idea is get those kids back in school, get your butts back to work, and make us money. That's the deal. And they're, they're 
uh, they they have they have they, they they will never give up with that, and this is dark money that's funding them. I you know I haven't figured out yet, and I'm pretty smart, but I haven't figured out how to fight dark money because this is the money that funds funds all all the stinkers that we have in Congress uh, and the lobbying committees. And uh, you don't see the money, and you'll never see the money because uh, unless they they nab a few people, as, as they've done, like the red light camera thing in uh, Illinois, they caught caught a senator taking a five thousand dollar bribe, and they he had to resign. So it cost him five thousand dollars of dark money to ruin his career. So people people are not smart. People are not smart about this. Uh, I, I really, I'm on here really to ask for ideas about how, how we can fight this because our children are dying. And with the long-term effects of COVID that we don't even know, just some of the, some of the things we're starting to see, there are terrible uh, long-term effects of COVID. And it, the COVID is not just in the respiratory uh, system. It also, they found uh, blood clotting around hearts. Imagine little guys who are just growing up. You know, what's going on in the scheme of their, their development? We don't know. We're not, we, we haven't been able to protect them. I, you know, I don't know if there's enough of us to understand and really come out of every house and home in the city. That's what I want. I just want everybody out, you know, just complaining, but they don't believe it. I was talking to a lady at the bus stop and she said, well, I, I told her I had just gotten the last COVID shot. She said, oh, she said, well, I don't know what's in those shots. I'm never going to never going to uh, get the shot because I don't know what's in it. And I'll lay you odds. She doesn't know all the ingredients that's in her fast food and the chicken that she was holding, bringing home for dinner. Uh, yeah, but she'll eat the chicken, but she won't take the shot. So there's a lot of stigma. There's a lot of uh, distrust. Uh, rightly so. I mean, why why would we ever trust the government? They took <laughs> they took all this time to even even decide what to do, and now they're saying, "Well, now you know, yeah, it's over. You don't have to protect yourself," and that's insane. So I'm here. I'm telling you about insanity and where we are. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Kathy, and I'm um, glad glad you're bringing an objective here for us to work on. Beautifully said. So up next, uh, we have uh, Nicole Braun, who she just wants to offer a few comments on what her experience is like. She, she's an adjunct in the Chicago area, and she's going to talk about the problems she's been experiencing. And, and higher ed, just like uh, public schools, are also under attack. They, they sh share similarities. Uh, maybe if I have time, I'll speak a little bit about uh, the, the city colleges of Chicago where I work. But uh, Nancy? Or Nicole? My bad, Nicole. <laughs> That's okay. I'm sorry I have my camera off. I have like vision issues and I'm also having a lot of technical issues today or the last couple of days, but I'm glad to be here. Um, and I, you know, I, I mostly am here to listen, but I'm happy to share my adjunct experiences. So one of the things um, that I, you know, I mean, obviously we're so poorly paid um, that it's, you know, like it's it, like how I feel even today. I'm, you know, I've been working nonstop. Um, I'm constantly, you know, working and resources are really um, limited. Um, students are really struggling. And it feels like even compared to when I first started teaching, you know, I'm teaching sort of like in a war zone in terms of, you know, like a lot of students are struggling with, you know, basic needs issues and survival issues. And so then it's, you know, obviously very difficult to focus on studying. Um, and in the meantime, you know, my perspective is that the higher education has just become increasingly, I mean, it's been like this for a long time, but I, I don't know what the end point is, um, but just so corporate. So for example, yesterday, I, I just, on top of all the other work that I'm doing, I just picked up another job. Um, so I have like 5 million jobs, 5 million passwords. Um, but I picked up a job um, at, you know, a, a university that is, I, I couldn't believe uh, the person who's in the sociology department, I teach in sociology, so she has her PhD in sociology. And this, uh, she told me, don't, 
father responding to the students' emails. Um, and I found that like so horrific um, because, you know, the reason why I'm teaching is because of students and, you know, to create like a better world and to talk, you know, about how we can do that. And so, you know, the fact that, you know, just seemed like such a corporate tactic to tell, you know, faculty, oh, just don't respond to any emails. I mean, it just, you know, she said, I just ignore them. And then if they ask me about it, I just tell them I didn't um, get their email. And I, yeah, I know that's what I thought. Um, so that was her advice um, at this new university that I'm starting to teach at. But it just, even the language like they the language that they use like you know people are managers or people are you know um they have all this new language that you know used to be a chair of a department now you're the you know whatever like they, they change all the language and then that changes the culture as well um so and there's so much focus on on all the wrong things in my opinion um but you know i um 75 of the faculty right now in this country who are in higher ed are, are um adjuncts. So, um, you know, it used to be that most of the time um, people were, you know, if they had full-time tenure track positions, um, you know, th there weren't that many adjuncts, but um, as time has gone on, you know, the population of adjuncts just keeps growing and then the amount of actually like stable positions that are decently paid um, keeps decreasing. Uh, so the contrast, it, it, you know, when we talk about like, you know, the dumbing down of higher ed or of the society or whatever, and I mean, it, it, you know, it's really hard uh, to think about how how to educate a society when, for one thing, students can't always concentrate because they're so busy struggling and working three jobs and trying to take care of a family and that kind of thing. But then also the faculty are like struggling too. So we don't have uh, any stability economically. I mean, we mostly don't have health benefits. Um, you know, I'm 55 years old and, you know, my whole life has been a struggle. I, I went to school, I lived in Flint, Michigan a long time ago and I was a young single mom. And I honestly believe that higher education was sort of like my ticket out, you know, so that I wouldn't be struggling economically anymore. And it's just like, I feel like, you know, I'm still in the same place economically. Um, and, you know, it, uh, it's really frustrating. So anyway, um, and then, and then I, I feel frustrated with a lot of my peers too, because I feel, I feel uh, concerned that, you know, they sort of bought into like this corporate mantra. Oh, either, either there's nothing that we can do about it some people what might say or they're just too exhausted or or whatever so i'm not sure if any of this made sense but i told lou that i would have fun and say a few things about the adjunct um the adjunct situation in particular and then maybe make some more general comments about higher ed but i i wasn't organized at all so i just blathered on so anyway thank you oh you were perfectly coherent nicole and um i i think i, I could definitely add to that conversation in terms of how the adjuncts in the city colleges are treated which is not very well at all. So up next we have uh, David Vance. He is a person connected to the South Seaside Education in the 10th Ward with Sugarza, or you know, Sugarza is uh, the other one there, and he's a member of SOAR. Um, so I don't know if you want to say a little bit more about yourself. David, so glad to have you. Okay, how's, how's the mic? Mike, First, can you hear great. me? Sounds great. Oh, okay, well, uh, so yeah, I've been in the educational struggle many years uh actually since i retired i'm a retired steel worker i'm not a teacher um but i got involved um when they started the charter school arnie duncan the propaganda but i wanted to jump everyone's heard everyone knows um more or less what what's been going on but i wanted to jump in with some more facts I don't want to repeat what people already know, but just, just to clarify, we've had 10 years of budget cuts in the public schools, in the majority of your neighborhood schools. Why? Because we've had 10 years of falling enrollment. And uh, it's called student-based budgeting. If you lose, lose student enrollment, they cut your budget. Uh, so this was called Renaissance 2010, uh, going back to um, the year 2010, even before 2009. Um, and so uh, what we see now, because it's been a, what I call a slow moving train wreck, 
where the uh, neighborhood schools have lost so much enrollment, they can, the way, the light of day, the future is, um, uh, we feel that speaking up now before there is a train wreck, okay, I'll give you an example. So um, east of the Ryan, I don't know if you can put that map up, Alan Harris, but we, I've been talking to the people over here on the South Chicago side, east side, um, where we have seven high schools, and they would all they all had over a thousand students each. Uh, CVS Chicago Vocational had closer to two thousand. Well, every all the enrollments have dropped. Hirsch, eighty students. Bowen, one hundred and eighty nine maybe. Harlan, probably 200, Corliss. Then you go up to High Park High School, which is in Woodlawn. They have probably four or 500, but all the schools had a thousand or more. And what we have, here's the facts. 60% of the enrollment is now in the charter school sphere they created seven charter high schools to compete with the seven public schools. And here's the fact, 60% of the enrollment is now in the charter school sphere, leaving 40% for public school enrollment. So what does this mean? Now that they wanna let, uh, there's a uh, state of Illinois, I don't have the exact dates, but they will permit at a, uh, at a pace, an elected school board. They'll, they will let us in a number of next year and the following year have an elected school board after they've drained the schools and taken our money. Oh, isn't that a, isn't that a situation? So the slow moving train wreck is here. Um, and uh, that's what CPS, Rahm Emanuel, Arne Duncan, that's what all the mayors have uh, gone along with this program. And uh, yeah, we've got lots of violence in the neighborhood. We've got lo lots of things we need to do in the schools were the bedrock. They have undercut the bedrock of the public schools. So, uh, so we don't have the cohesion, good or bad, but we had schools that could elevate the students. And, um, uh, and so we have very little left in most of our public schools. I think I'll stop there. Um, is that enough? <laughs> I, I think so. Um. <laughs> And, and I, if I could just add a, a little bit, um, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with the National Teachers Academy. The National Teachers Academy was in a, a fight with the mayor. They wanted to close it because of gentrification, you know, a lot of the, you know, bourgeoisie were moving into the neighborhood. It's just a, a school real close to Chinatown. My kids go there now. And so it was a huge victory that that community won to keep that school open. But unfortunately, what's happened, as you know, uh, with the loss of enrollment, and also they, they moved uh, primarily to an LSE system. They had, I can't remember the other, it was a two-part system and they had more funding. But so so they lost about 300 grand of their budget. They don't have money for substitutes, like a lot of schools. It's still very united. The parents are very active and contribute money for like computers, supplies. You know, my husband and I provide snacks every week, you know, so the kids will have a snack uh, before lunch. But what's concerning is that, well, they couldn't shut the school down, right? So now what they're going to do is build a high school close to where NTA is. And my thinking is, why is it spending all this money building a high school just for these uh, upper class kids or whomever when they have uh, high schools that are under enrolled that need students? There's a school nearby that they could go to. This doesn't make any sense. The other thing that infuriated me about budget cuts is because I was looking at the spreadsheet in the summer of how they were planning to cut budgets. There were schools on the north side that had drops in enrollment. They got way more money than Oro School School, than schools in the south side, schools in Little Village. And so this to me is systematic racism. 
Why are the poorest black and brown neighborhoods suffering so much because of drop in enrollment when they need money? And so one of the slogans we had was, you know, funding based on needs, not metrics. We, we need to fund schools based on what students needs, counselors, uh, libraries, you know, nurses. Uh, and and um, so I, I think this, this is the where we're at. And, and I, I agree that not just charter schools, but how the voucher system is, uh, is uh, prioritizing private schools is criminal. This this money, uh, I mean, I, I just it just baff, it just baff, it baffles me on the one hand, but it just infuriates me that private schools that don't necessarily need all this money are are, are you know where 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 are when when are my kids going to get the education they deserve? You know what I mean? And so I, I think that's um, concerning. The other thing I heard, and maybe somebody can confirm, I've been wanting to look at this is that potentially they may not have a school lunch program anymore, thanks to Trump. And so then what are kids supposed to do? We, we are very blessed to be in a school where the, the people do a really great job of providing food, even during the pandemic. They provided a breakfast, a snack, a lunch, and not just like a, in some schools, they were just providing like a breadstick and, and a yogurt, which is not nutritionally enough for a child, right? We've been very blessed to have a community where there's there they have they've had nutritious lunches. Uh, the people that run the kitchen are very very good, you know. Um, but uh, what what are they going to do without money? I mean, it's, it's going to be up to the community to support each other and meet the needs of the students. And it shouldn't be that way. You can't tell me that the city doesn't have the money to provide, you know. And I know I keep saying this that they got these millions of dollars in CARES funds. Who knows what happens to it? Who and the same thing was true in the city colleges. We got money for tech reimbursements. They denied almost every reimbursement. Uh, they, they didn't use the money how they were supposed to, you know? And so we're, we're struggling too. We've had to rely on her funds to, to, you know, lift us a foot. And the state actually helped a little bit with funding, but that's just for this year. What about next year? You know, uh, and, and um, so it's a problem. And I, and I think it's, it's, it's gonna get worse. And it's, to me, it's concerning, you know? And I know a lot of us were worried that with these budget cuts that we're going to start closing schools again, I wouldn't doubt it. Their plan isn't to succeed. I think their plan is to fail and privatize at the expense of our kids. And uh, that 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 needs to stop, right? So that's all I had to say. I know it's just a little bit, you know, but I'd be glad to say more. Um, and I think that's all the people we have on staff. Did anybody else want to speak? Thank you, Maribeth. Lou, did you want to speak a little bit? I'll say a few words. Uh, you always count on me to open my mouth. Um, yeah, I think what people have been pointing to is a uh, is really an outright assault on public education. And there's a reason for that. It's not just because there are bad people in office, but there's a reason for it. I mean, there are bad people in office. That, that Don't get me wrong. But that's not the only reason. The main reason that there is an assault on public education is that public education doesn't really hold the key to uh, prosperity any longer because of a shrinking ability of the job market to really absorb everybody who's graduated from schools. The, because of automation, because of robotics, because of all kinds of things, the, <clears throat> the labor participation rate goes down. And the fact is that, that the society, the powers that be, the ruling class, if you will, has already decided that they don't need so many people. That's why there is a prison, uh, a school to prison pipeline. That's why I think Kathy wanted to also talk about the school to deportation pipeline and we can um, come back to that but fundamentally fundamentally one of the things that public education does or could do is teach people to think critically about the society and help them formulate how to envision something better and accomplish that that's what critical thinking can do. Unfortunately, the assault on education is really aimed at creating an obedient society and not one that's willing to challenge or capable of challenging. And I think 
the that's a basic need that we all have. And I think that's what we're fighting for, is the ability to be able to get the things that we need. And so you referred to <clears throat> dis distributing the resources to the schools according to need. And that's really important because that's a general maxim for all of society. Why should the richest people in this country, the richest people in, in Illinois, own hundreds, or maybe not hundreds, but many mansions, and there are people living in tents because they can't get a home? So the question of distribution according to who needs it is really being forced upon us by society, by the ruling class that refuses to answer the, the needs that we've got, whether that's educational or otherwise. And that's kind of where I want to leave it. All right. Uh, Thomas, I, you know, we, we were originally going to um, do a, a, a midpoint, Lou, to be, should we just do questions and answers in the break and then come back? Sure. All right, so I see a hand up. Thomas, you, you want to speak? Yeah, thanks, Azu. Um, no can you hear me? Yes, you sound great. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I think that um, there, there is another question here uh, that I want to get into, and it's politics, which is that uh, you can't really have a healthy democracy if the citizens aren't well informed. And we know that you know we have this orange-headed you know, clown running around. And I think the, the ruling class is split over you know, when to start fascism. And I think we're talking about you know, uh, keeping what Lou said about keeping the people uninformed, obedient, that kind of thing, that a healthy democracy demands um, knowledge and, and understanding. And that knowledge has to prevail, needs to prevail in democratic discourse. And one of the things that the orange haired clown is doing is he's got these people that are all involved in burning fossil fuels and they, they want to keep their money together. And obviously that has, to, you know, we can't do this, to, you know, there's, there's a hurricane, there's a hurricane headed for Canada. I thought they played hockey up there. What the hell is going on? Um, but but I, I think, um, uh, I, I think that this is really a fundamental thing for the society to look at and that you know, if, if public education won't educate our, our, our youth, we, we have to find a way to do it with, you know, with politicized means. And that this is really very, very fundamental. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. All right, thank you. Anybody else have questions or comments? Uh, in the chat, Nicole raised the issue in terms of a uh, student debt, which is, um, it's critical. I mean, one of the things I tell my students is if you can live in your parents' basement or, you know, six people to an apartment or whatever, don't take out loans because it's just, uh, and, and, and I was really, in, I was upset by the controversy that it caused, you know, they could have done more, they could have, they could have canceled all that. Biden could have cho chosen to cancel all that, you know, um, but they didn't go that route. They just canceled a portion of it. But even, even then the, the issue for me is, you know, when I graduated from college, I um I had my six months of of um you know what would you call that uh, when they forgiveness right I didn't have to pay anything back, but then I I I called back uh because I didn't have a job, and it was fine I had my debt you know I didn't have to pay it back until I got a job thank God I got a full time job as a faculty member you know or I probably would have you know still been deferring it but I I I think that 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 is what's missing now there's no compassion when it comes to this and. I like I I don't know I think my my loan has been um, bought and sold by I don't know how many banks we don't know you know um, they they could easily raise the interest rate on the loan and we have no control over that right and so I think that's a problem and so just just uh, even that educating students about finding alternatives even if it means um, just just taking fewer classes you know or or what have you because we want our students to succeed. But we want them to also be able to function, and it, I know it's difficult. The cost of living is going up. We hear about students that can't buy cars, they can't, they can't afford to buy houses. Should I, I would argue that a lot of people can't afford to buy houses in Chicago because the real estate here is outrageous. But it's it's a it's concerning, you know. And and uh, so one of the things that my union, the Cook County College Teachers Union, has been advocating for is free higher education, 
uh, the city colleges used to be free up until the 1970s. I think you had to pay like an $8 fee to process the application. But then state-funded, state, state, -funded, state run schools were also free. My dentist got his dental degree for free. And this wasn't that long ago. It was in like in the 1990s. So, so uh, you know, we, we see how, how uh, the institutions are deteriorating and, and it's, it's, a, it's a problem, right? But uh, Lou, I, I see you, you're on stack. Go ahead. Did you have your hand up? You're muted, brother. I can't remember what I wanted to say now. Um, I'll come back. Kathy, do you want to speak to that point? Uh, she's talking about the elected school board. She says, we want to get a proper elected school board. We also in the city colleges don't have an elected school board. We're one of the few institutions I don't. And we are still, we still are trying to get our bill through. Um, it, I think it's died twice, you know, but uh, we have a, a board that's appointed by the mayor. And uh, again, you see, you know, shenanigans and just the destruction of programs for profit. And in the end, it doesn't help enrollment. Just like, just like um, anybody else or other topics related to education? I do remember what I wanted to say. Okay. I actually wanted to ask Nicole that I've been really privileged to uh, be in on some conversations uh, with Nicole and some of her, you know, looking at some of her uh, students and what they've written. And I'd really love to hear from to her share some of her experiences. I mean, she teaches sociology and she does such a good job. She has such amazing students. So I, I just kind of wanted to hear some of what she had to say. And I see she's got her hand up anyway. Yeah, she has her hand up. Go ahead, Nicole. Oh, shut up. Oh, good. No, no, no. You're that's great. Actually, um, I was <laughs> trying to my my laptop is all messed up, so I was trying to like uh, type on the phone on the phone, and I was like, oh well. Just, oh, I'm getting it. You may have to Nicole. You may have to mute out the computer. Or somebody, because there's a lot of back feet. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Let me no, see. You're, you're good now. You're good now. Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I was just going to say, um, well, thanks for saying that about my students. One thing I was going to say that was sort of like a different thing um, was that, you know, one of the colleges that I work for is actually like, I teach remotely, but I'm working, I don't have classes there this semester, but in California, but the faculty union there, um, they do not support the eradicate the eradication of all student loan debt, which I find um, really annoying. And so I, I'm sort of like wrestling with the fact um, that fact, and then how, how do we deal with the fact that, you know, some labor unions aren't as supportive of things like, you know, um, free college for all, higher ed um, should be accessible to everybody, eradicate all student loan debt. So that's what I was going to say. But in terms of my students, um, you know, I've... Um, you know, I wish I could, I, I should have brought some of the student quotes uh, to, to read because they are really powerful. But, you know, my goal is to obviously have students talk about their real lives and then relate, you know, their real lives to whatever's happening sociological, sociologically um, into the concepts. And so we talk a lot about economic inequality and racism and um, sexism and all that, all that stuff. Um, but but I feel, you know, it's hard for me because I feel sort of like, you know, I'm giving people what I hope to give students language and, you know, I learn from them as well. Um, but what, you know, I, I feel like everyone is still like such in a, a oppressive situations, even in terms of like what they're thinking about for their like quote unquote futures. Um, so I wish there were more, I guess, more action or more social movement around um, students organizing to act, like create like a different kind of um, world. Like I have students, you know, it's like they could be really radical, but it's like, what are you going, what's your, what are you going into? Oh, I'm going into uh, Homeland Security or something, um, you know, or I'm going into, uh, let me think of another one that seems to be a common one. I mean, they're just really um, kind of frightening future uh future situations. And so, I mean, even if they have the consciousness now, I, I just sort of wonder what it's going to be like if there's no sort of like collective um, 
you know, collective movement around what a mess everything is. It's sort of like, you know, the institutions keep imposing all these sort of like corporate corporate realities onto the students as well. And so, you know, that's what they sort of envision for their future is they don't have really a choice, but they have to go into the things that, you know, are supposed, supposed to have, um, or they're supposed to have jobs. So, and they're taking out tons of loans and debt. Oh my goodness, my cat is like attacking me <laughs> because she hates it when I'm talking um, and I'm not paying attention to her. So I am shutting her out of the room. Um, but, you know, like, I feel really honored to hear, you know, my students talk about their, um, their real life stories and that sort of thing. And, you know, right now, actually, I'm teaching the sociology of health and illness. So we're talking a lot about, you know, who has access to what in terms of health, you know, who has access to higher education, who has better health. I mean, in sociology, we say, and it's like a no brainer, but um, the wealthier, the healthier. So we've been talking a lot about, about that. Um, so the students provide a lot of insights and I do a lot of sort of like sociological questioning to get them to think about, you know, even what they're saying or how they've been socialized to see. Um, so anyway, I feel like I'm just rambling um, again, but I hope some of this made a little bit of sense. Nicole, you are never rambling. You are on point, even with a cat interruption. <laughs> yes, that's me. No, I think it's great. I, I love what you said. Um, oh my gosh. And it's, I'm sorry, this is what happens as you know, get older. You, you said a phrase that was, that was super catchy and so on point. And I can't think of it, but it was really, really, really well said. You know, um, somebody help me out. Did you do the, uh, anyway, good. It was good. <laughs> Thank to you. to, to let's hear from the cat too. <laughs> no, that's beautiful. Uh, and and uh, yeah, the the thing of what kind of world are they going to go into? And I mean, my students too. I don't I I, I don't want to pop their burst their bubble, but I think you know I, I want them to succeed. And but we don't know what the market has in the future. I I was in Washington State when the dot com bubble, the first one burst, caused a lot of you know families to lose homes and whatnot but I remember at the time when I was teaching at Washington State a lot of the students were getting degrees in tech but there's no guarantee you know um and so I always tell my students get a degree you love and something you're going to love doing because there are no guarantees um and um uh, you know but yeah that's, so that's something that I think students need to learn on their own but all right that's frightening the thing about the homeland security bit that that, that I was like whoa you know all right. Anybody else? Maybe some of some of the students who are present want to talk about these issues, or if you have thoughts about the public school system. I, I see Walda is here. Walda um, is or was a professor. Okay. Hey, Sue. You're you're out. So um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I taught at Howard for fifty years uh, before I retired in doing revolutionary education elsewhere. I'm, you know, I'm listening and, and everything that's being said, whether it's, you know, K through 12 or higher ed resonates, right? Resonates with the crisis, the economic crisis, and also the crisis of, are we free as teachers to teach the truth, right? And I think what I'm struck by is, okay, been going on for a while and we're all kind of in the same boat. Those of us in higher ed um, for quite a few decades have been in a contingent, you know, very marginal situation. What are we gonna do about it? I've kind of heard a vision, right? I mean, I've, I've heard people say the kind of education we want, but my question is politically, how are we gonna organize ourselves really across um, the different levels of education. I uh, just read a piece that um, AAUP, which is uh, American Association of University Professors, is now collaborating with AFT, American Federation of Teachers, um, to really organize uh, adjunct and higher ed faculty. But it's, it's really time for the NEA and all of the other you know, unions and all of the workers at all these levels to begin to have conversations together about what's our political strategy. 
So I just wanted to throw that out. And if people want to respond to that, I would love to hear how we're moving politically um, to broaden out our base of educators, parents, and students. And the unions that sometimes do and sometimes don't represent us. Yes. That's an excellent question. Uh, do we want to take a short political break and come back to that? Because I think that question is key. Lou, is that okay with you and all? We're gonna play a couple of uh, pieces um, and a couple of poems and then come back to that really, really crucial question. And I was actually at the AFT convention. Um, so I can I can just speak a little bit about, about that, but um, here we go. This first piece is a, a phenomenal poem. And let me just, and uh, Miha, um, Maribeth, if you could put the, the um the link to the text and the the url that'd be great so you can experience it fully let me okay this was a molly meacham how a political poem was bullied out of me how a political poem was bullied out of me i had never been small until i heard how evil i am for being a teacher with the lie levels rising in newspapers, emails, interviews, announcements, the steady flood of anti-teacher propaganda dissolves dis dignity past patience until I am invisible and taste of salt. Me. The frightening news of room 202 is this incredible shrinking violet. I've often told students to absorb environment and squeeze it into their writing. But I, hypocrite, cannot check my mail without earplugs and blinders now. There is always a top story that burns my cheeks ashen and I am scattered by breath. But there is no headline for me or for colleagues who've sold houses, who've taken on loans and Gray Street temples to brace for this fight. The headlines are about these politicians, their pockets and their pride. Articles full of double speak and fork tongue hissing. The mayor and the board deal students as playing cards and stack decks and they know nothing of the kids themselves. Her grammar jokes his zombie impression, that he's afraid his father is never getting out of jail and his mom has breast cancer, mm. that she is the first in her family to go to college and got bullied, that he came out of the closet and his mother is praying for evil to cease its possession, that she reinvents the world on the page and then stages it. These kids swirl in cutbacks, media overloads, starved affections and poetry. They swear and swagger and smile metal. The fact these kids are alive and breathing knowledge in deadly communities is more miracle than Lazarus rising, and they do. They baptize their papers in ink and wash drafts clean with red. They highlight, spotlight, moonwalk, I mean, they are teenagers. <laughs> there are mad dashes through the halls, too many tardies and dress code violations, but they are green and sprouting. Dandelions and dahlias, ivy, wisteria and willows. I am a simple gardener, tilling with words, preparing the, the ground, Loam, sand, silt, clay. The clay models itself into familiarity, into the expression of understanding that's unique to each child. The board wants me to only see numbers, to measure the kids with percentages, to see them as payment and value added. Well, I am an English teacher. Numbers have never been my thing. I see 
Their learning is the shape of a yellow raft on a green river. We are the river dwellers. There is no salt in our water. It feels wrong to hate politicians who have never even met me, but they made us feel minuscule, buzzing winged things like gnats or mosquitoes for being teachers. It makes me hunger for biblical retribution, so I will be an insect. In a plague of cicadas, we will be dressed as a river of blood, a torrent of chant and noise. There is no poem for this fight, for watching the mild-mannered lose their voices from screaming chants, feet raw with marching, hands calloused for chalk will be rubbed with new blisters from holding signs. If we are faceless, let us be the drought, the blight, the salt in this freshwater city, so our students will not be nameless, faceless scores in a city that hunts them for statistics. We will be living the politics, not writing a poem. Mm -hmm. I invite you and ask you to stand with me for them. <laughs> Fantastic poem. Beautiful. Sam, what a poem. Right? <laughs> I'm back. What gave you? Brilliant. Okay. One more. This is another piece by uh, Adam Gottlieb called uh, um, Pedagogy of the Poets. And I think I heard this at a Teaching for Social Justice Conference, if I remember right. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece. So let me share that with you. And then we'll go back to this important question that Walter framed. Um, how, how do we get to the education? that how are we gonna organize politically? How are we gonna unite around these important questions? So let me see. Education either functions as an instrument which is used to facilitate integration of the younger generation into the logic of the present system and bring about conformity or it becomes the practice of freedom, the means by which people deal critically and creatively with reality and discover how to participate in the transformation of their world. Paulo Freire, hmm. Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Pedagogy of the Poets. This is our classroom, this cipher, this circle this open mic to amplify our voices, this talking stick, this ritual, this space where we are all teachers and students and our conversation is the lesson. Voices in dialogue, concert, testimonies, meeting, alchemizing in the air. This is our eternal truth, our only theory, our sacred text ever changing. We are movement, evolution, truly human being praxis. We practice the art of speaking and listening. The word and the silence are the legs on which we walk. The word to name ourselves and the world. The silence to hear what others are saying. The word to know, to defend, to dream. Silence, soil to receive these seeds. This is the garden the ecosystem. This is art and age old wisdom. This is the theater. This is the stage. This is the altar on which we pray. This is our church and our town hall, our Congress and congregational. This is our government. We are the legislators. This is our classroom. We are the educators. Capitalist pedagogy works top down. Study for the test. Listen up, shut your mouth. Standardized curricula written by the state memorizing disconnected facts for a grade. Keep it compartmentalized, don't connect the dots. Teach them to be satisfied with the poverty they got. Never use the word oppression, that's unpatriotic. And don't teach ethnic studies or you'll go to jail, got it? Water down the history, literature, social studies, out with creativity, we don't need critical thinkers, do we? In a system where the vast majority of jobs are to slave away for minimum wage working for a boss. But something new is happening, now even that is gone. Automated labor has created 
created a new problem. They don't need us working in their factories no more, but they do need us in warehouses so they can win their war. So they close the public schools when they want to make a buck, but when COVID puts our lives at risk, they do not give a fuck. They say, we got to open schools, the ones we haven't closed, because we don't care if you live or die, and where else would you go? Maybe jail, maybe prison, maybe concentration camps, while they beef up the police state and they bail out the banks, closing clinics, building condos, putting people on the street. That's the kind of education we gonna get from the elite. If this shit ain't fucking fascist, well then I don't know what is. Tyranny of corporation, slavery inc. Light putting buddies up in city hall, huddle like a pack of vicious vultures to callously shutter up another housing project till there's not even one left. Selling public schools out for charter paychecks, packing 50 students in a class with old books, cutting back, special ed, art and music go first, then it's nurses, counselors, janitors, lunch is gross meat soon enough, they're sitting in a room with no heat. But it's all about the kids, right? Lori's on our side. It's not her fault we got an educational apartheid. It's gotta be the teachers. Them motherfuckers lazy. Better bust their unions up, cut their payment, raise fees. Call me crazy, but I think I see a pattern. They're taking away our basic needs while they keep getting fatter. Mm -hmm. Their politics are like their classes, just monologue. Turning schools into prison, soft holocaust. All of us now have to make a decision. Keep trying to fix a broken capitalist system or redesign society. Unite for a new vision where everyone participates and everybody listens. This is why we make a space for everyone to talk. This is what democracy looks like, hip hop. This is our pedagogy. This is why we rock the mic and we pass it so the cipher don't stop. All right. Awesome. So I'm going to segue back to this question. Great poetry, right? I, I love that. Um, <laughs> sorry, getting private, private. All right. Kathy Power says, The System is a Sickness by R.D. Wolf. Getting a lot of love. And Kathy says, Lori is my muse. I have special poems for her. <laughs> right, maybe you might want to share one at the end. Okay, so let's get back to this. Um, especially interested in those of you who who have 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 been in the struggle what you've done to unite with other organizations or what what do you think how, how can we get to this this vision of education that we want for our public school students or our students in higher education that um are getting shackled by debt yes very good uh nicole well, I, um, I had a couple thoughts about that. One thing, um, and I heard someone mention it earlier, um, but I know that um, there's a new organization in higher ed that's trying to hook up with um, various labor unions. Um, it's, and there's a lot of controversy around it amongst academics, but the group is called um, HELU. I'm not sure if anybody has ever heard of it, but it's called, it uh, stands for Higher Education Labor United. I think that's what it stands for. Um, so I've gone to some meetings with them. Um, it's, you know, they're, they, they definitely want to push for uh, access for everyone to have free access to higher education, to college, and they also want to eradicate all student loan debt and then transform um, higher ed as it is. Um, so that's one thing that I can think of that um, is, an, is a group or a movement that's trying to do some work around these issues. Um, and as we know, I mean, from a sociological perspective, the people who have the most debt are often or usually people of color and from working class or poor backgrounds. So um, I think Biden said once or maybe more than once that, um, the people with the debt are the most privileged. And so one of the excuses he gave for not wanting to eradicate student loan debt is he felt like it would benefit um, privileged people. And so that was uh, really frustrating, I, I thought. Um, so, so anyway, because the, the truth is the people who have the most debt are the most marginalized. So there's that piece. So people are just shackled you know, for life. And then the other piece is that, um, as everybody would agree with, um, and if I'm talking too much, please tell me to stop. But you know, one of the things that bothers me is that, you know, education should be like a, a social good um, that, you know, 
um, works for the society. And so people, you know, like people who are getting degrees, who are doing things like in social work or, you know, um, teachers or, you know, doctors or, or whomever is getting, um, you know, they, they shouldn't be, I mean, they're giving us like a, I hate to use the language of service, but they're giving something to the society. So their degree is a social good as well. Um, the education is a social good. So um, that's one thought I have. And then the other um, group or movement that I'm aware of, um, what are they called? I have to Google it. Um, but I've actually like uh, been a part of them. And actually we're going on strike, um, but it's more like a metaphor of the strike is, um, but it's about, we're not paying back our student loan debt. Um, and so I can, uh, when I Google the, uh, the information, I, I'm part of it, my brain is huh, whatever today or every day, but I, I'll Google the information, but I, um, it's a growing movement of people who are just like, we're not going to pay um, our student loan debt. And so I've been in some meetings um, where people have been talking about the horrors of their debt, um, what their dreams were, how their dreams were destroyed by the, the debt, or they took out loans. The other piece is they took out loans for their kids. That's another huge piece. And so, you know, you hear these horrible stories of you know, like parents who are older and, you know, sometimes even like disabled and, and or retired and struggling, you know, and, and limited income. And then they're like, you know, battling the student loan sharks um, for their kids because they wanted their kids to have the dream of going to college. So anyway, there's that movement that's going on as well. So um, I don't know how to get all the labor unions on board with this, but I think it would be super po powerful if labor unions, um, you know, my, I'm, I, you know, sorry, I don't know as much about K through 12, but I can talk a lot about higher ed, um, but labor unions, you know, like, like my union um, in California um, seems to have zero interest in, 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 you know, the student loan eradication problems I mentioned earlier. So, um, you know, how labor unions could get on board to address these issues and, and the other issues, you know, I could talk about like the, you know, the issues with critical race theory. Um, that's like another huge thing that's happening. Um, that's really problematic. I mean, what's happening, you know, I mean, just in Arizona alone, but across the street in terms of, or across the country in terms of women, women's rights and like what, you know, the classroom looks like in terms of being able to have academic freedom and what to talk about. Um, um, and so how that sort of um, become like extremely confining as well. So once again, I threw a bunch of stuff out there, but um, just some thoughts. And I'll Google the name of that organization that I was telling you about. I'll Google both of them and put them in the chat. Right. And they've asked for the, the Hilo. That's the first time I hear about it. Um, yeah, for sure. I, and uh, I just wanted to, oh my gosh, I had so many ideas on hand. I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to over talk, but this is, you know, as a professor and the mother of two kids, Holy shit. I mean, I can't imagine what it's good. I have a 12 year old that wants to go to Harvard. I'm sure he's going to get there. He's a straight A student, but I can't imagine the amount of debt we're going to have to get into, you know, um, and it shouldn't have to be that way. But um, uh, what what I wanted to to also talk about was, um, oh, heck, let's just move on. It'll come back to me. But um, uh, David, I don't know if you want to speak to your issues. You're saying that, oh, it came back to me. Oh, hold up, hold up, sorry. Okay, so one, <laughs> sorry. one of the proposals we have, because I'm on the faculty bargaining team for the Cook County College Teachers Union, and we borrowed this from the Chicago Teachers Union. I, I think UTLA also has this in their contract, was uh, a community colleges for the common good proposal where we, we just want to start to seed program where we would partner with schools so we could offer wraparound services. So each city college will be partnered with a high school um, and that's we've asked for like a $500,000 budget because even in the city colleges, we don't have enough uh, counselors. We do have wellness programs. You know, we, we understand that our students are, are food insecure, that they need housing, perhaps childcare, and uh, how to service and document to students and others. So uh, for now, the uh, city attorney has said that, of course, they hired an the outside legal counsel, even though they have three attorneys. This high powered union busting attorney has said that that's not a subject of impact bargaining. And, and I argued with him, I'm like, well, you want our students to succeed? Do you want higher enrollments? This is how we're gonna get it. And he just didn't wanna talk about it anymore. you know. So we're gonna have to you know, push on that, but it's really important. The other thing that we also put in our contract was a, a, a ratio where we said, look, we want the full-time faculty percentage to be higher and we want adjuncts to be pulled into the full-time faculty lane. And again, they're saying, you know, it's a sub, it's not a subject of impact bargaining, but in our union, uh, we have adjuncts that get paid like $4,000 a course, which is an increase from what it was before. They're some of the lowest paid adjuncts in the, in the country. 
you know, um, and so it's it's really unconscionable what happens what's, what happens at that level. But I think when you have uh, contracts that look at the needs of the community, that that's really important. And we're also talking about putting language to guarantee that that the city pays for women's reproductive rights. Um, I know the city just passed an or uh, an ordinance recently, or is they're talking about passing an ordinance where they 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 do that for Chicago. But it's it's not enough. It's, it's got to be expanded, right? And this is also one of the ways that we can fight fascism is by having labor contracts that address issues that go beyond um, the needs of the faculty or or the unit that they're bargaining for, you know. And so that's that's one thing. Um, all right, somebody else. Uh, Kathy says um, that academics are not usually trained in labor organizing. That's true, and uh, they should connect with labor notes. Really on point. Hey, Jerome. Are you still on? Oh, I was gonna call in Jerome because J Jerome gave a presentation at the Labor Nose Conference and I wanted to hear what he had to say, but I, I think he's he's moved. Ah, back to David, I apologize. Thank you, thank you, sister. David. Yeah, uh, hey, um, yeah, well, um, I'm involved in uh, the Southeast, uh, South Chicago area. Just repeating again, hello everyone. And in the chat, I just posted um, because as, as I have been, uh, uh, trying to organize for uh, the future of Bowen, but I found out uh, that the CTU has in their current contract negotiated 20 sustainable neighborhood schools with, with full funding. And so that's the demand. And it, it really needs to be a grassroots movement of parents and, and community and teachers here to demand full funding, demand, uh, no budget cuts. And uh, I was looking in some of the, uh, in my file, going back five years ago, when Diet High School uh, w organized, they had a hunger strike. And I was looking at their demands. And there, there was 50, uh, they listed one of their demands as 50 sustainable neighborhood schools, 50 sustainable neighborhood schools, no budget cuts. And so when we look at the situation, I have talked with the CTU, uh, how can we expand that? So it, it, it does, uh, it, the union has a certain leverage to fight, but not, not the whole situation because the public doesn't quite understand when, when they start closing public schools, they're gone. Oh, because uh, parents wanted choice. That's what they said 10 years ago. Uh, and so I'm getting a, um, that's a little bit of the propaganda that started all of this. Um, and so it's, so the union and the neighborhood, and we have community groups like Raise Your Hand. We have at Hirsch, they, they self-formed, as I said in the chat, the Future of Hirsch Committee. Yeah, but that's already when the train wreck uh, with 80 students, um, uh, then then people wake up. Oh yeah, uh, with 80 students, we need to we need to organize because no one's going to do it but us. And that's kind of um, where we're at. People don't wake up until the train wreck is at the door. Um, uh, so I'm kind of. Um, wanted to, not that I have a solution, it's almost like crumbs off the table when you get to the contract. How can we get 20 or 30 uh, sustainable neighborhood schools, no budget cuts, a five-year educational plan? Hey, that's what, that's what CPS should be doing now. Oh, but they're not because uh, they, they, they are, they are appointed by the mayor. And so we've, um, the train wreck is, is coming, it's close by, and the public still doesn't see it. Um, I don't, uh, you know, we, we would, we demand uh, schools, better neighborhoods, and there has to be the kind of parent, uh, teacher, union, struggle, uh, they're just not going to give us money because we want to have decent schools and a, and a future for our kids. They, they want to 
they will give that money to the selective enrollment schools. Okay, so that, and they will give that money to the private interests. So we all, uh, so that, that's not just the handwriting on the wall, that's what they've done. And so the disinvestment in our neighborhood schools is, is here. I'm not sure if the public has, woke, has awoken yet, uh, but um, we need to keep talking about it. And uh, can I mention one more thing about the disinvestment? They, this summer, they didn't have enough lifeguards for the public pools in the hot summer. Your park district couldn't find lifeguards. Well, guess what? Go back and look at, Hirsch has a pool, Harlan, Corliss, these are the, and CVS, they're all school, these are indoor million dollar pools that are all closed. Oh, are, not only are they cutting educational programs, but swim programs, and now there's no lifeguards in the summer. Oh boy, uh, it's uh, a disinvestment is, and, and then th this go goes back to June, I'll try to stop. They blamed it on COVID because uh, things didn't, they, they just didn't get enough lifeguards out. Anyway, I'll stop there. We need to fight, organize. Those are the solutions, nothing's new. Oh, well, I don't know if nothing's new. I think things are getting far worse though, you know. Um, Lou, I see you're on stack and then Deborah after. Go ahead, Lou. Let Deborah speak first since, uh, since she hasn't and I have. Oh, for sure, I apologize. Uh, Deborah? How is my audio? Can I be heard uh, all right? You sound great. Good, thank you. Lou, that was very kind of you. Thank you for allowing me to, to speak. Uh, I, I want to comment on uh, David's, uh, David's information that he shared. These high schools that he mentioned, particularly Bowen and CVS, I grew up in that neighborhood. I, I did not go to those schools, but my quote, best friend, uh, through high school, went to Bowen. I, I can't imagine 100, and I think David said 189 students go to school at Bowen now. Bowen and CVS are immense. The pool is shut down at CVS. I learned, I learned to uh, dive off the side of a pool at that pool as a child. Uh, taking swimming lessons there. I, it's, I am so appalled to hear this. I knew enrollment was down, but these schools uh, were just bastions of, of all round educations that, and they were conduits to professional jobs and uh, skilled, uh, there were woodworking classes at CVS. There, there was so much. So I'm, I'm less familiar with Hirsch, Harlan, uh, and the other schools that David mentioned, but uh, it's gonna take me a while to recover from the reality that Bowen and CVS are in this. In fact, I think at one point they wanted to close Bowen because I remember watching on the internet uh, a public meeting where the faculty got, uh, stood up and, and before the school board and were allotted two minutes, I think was their time to make their case to express themselves uh, against closing Bowen. I was relieved that it remained open, but to imagine 189 students rattling around in in a, a building that size. It, and then um, as Heisu, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. You got it. Said, I am good, thank you. 
they're building a new school next to a school that needs assistance now. This is beyond incongruous. It's 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 morally so offensive that these things are going on. Oh, and also, while I just have this time, the the conditions for adjunct faculty I'm very aware of. I went to Columbia College and I, I uh, left there in the 80s, but over the years I stayed in contact with Columbia through the Alumni Association. I saw the increase in at number of adjunct faculty. I saw how exploited this faculty was, how much labor, how much preparation for class, how much went effort went into uh, these faculty members who had no benefits, who were underpaid, who had to piece together numerous courses to try to make a living. Uh, I saw that develop and I saw it develop at the same time as outside of the sphere of education. Uh, people were forced to knit together three jobs to eke out a living with no benefits in any of those jobs. I, I just saw all these things develop and I saw the relationship uh, between it happening in education and in non-education, the exploitation of labor. So thank you for, for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on this and also for informing me uh, about all this information because as painful as it is to know it and learn it, it must be known and it must be learned. Thank you. Uh, Lou? Yeah, um, I think the, uh, the point that uh, I just want to take off from the point that Deborah was, was leaving with, it must be known. But I also want to go to what Walda was asking is how do we organize politically around this, these questions? Um, and I'm going to add a few points, uh, I think, but I'm not, I'm certainly not going to provide any answers. Um, one thing I want to say is that we talk about this question of parental choice, and that's a really interesting um, terminology. It's not new. Um, and we should look and see who is promoting it in particular. And we'll find that the same people are promoting the issues like parental choice are the ones that are promoting things like states' rights. And there's an interesting correlation there. I mean, after all, you've got a federal government that presumably establishes standards beyond for education, let's say. But it's states' rights, the states have the right to do whatever they want to do you know, to a certain extent. And so you get all kinds of defunding, and David spoke eloquently to the defunding of education in Chicago, the total disinvestment in a certain section of Chicago, where a quarter of a million people have left, which is one reason why, over the last two, uh, 20 years, which is one reason why there's such a decrease in enrollment, not to mention the fact that there are at least as many charter schools in that same area as there are public schools now. So no wonder there's a smaller number of kids. But is that a political choice? Well, yes, it is. It is a political choice in which the parents really have no choice. And that, those, this is a political choice <clears throat> enforced upon us by the major corporate uh, funders of these charter schools and the private schools. So this is a, uh, and, and politically th through, uh, I can't remember who it was that mentioned Betty, Betsy DeVos, I mean, I think it was Kathy right at the beginning. Um, well, Betsy DeVos is just the latest. She was in the Trump administration, but can we say any better about Arnie Duncan who came from Chicago and was a Democrat? Of course not. I mean, <clears throat> this is, uh, um, David probably remembers this, David Vance probably remembers this, but uh, George Schmidt, who used to edit 
before he died, used to edit a, a newspaper here called Substance about public schools in, in Chicago. Uh, David would talk about the Ayn Rand quote on uh, on Arnie Duncan's uh, door in in uh, on the fifth floor of uh, of uh, of the uh, city hall. I mean, th these are the people that are are running our education system. So politically, what do we do? Um, I think certainly we have to have these kinds of conversations, and we have to figure out strategically what, what our next steps are. We all are engaged in different immediate battles. But if we're going if we're going to rise above that, we have to figure out how we develop and, and if we're just talking about education, we have to figure out how we're going to develop a national plan about education. <clears throat> how are we going to attack the um, the strategy of the people who are attacking us? How are we going to approach? I mean, we have to know what they're thinking. So how do we look at what they're doing in terms of privatizing and attempting to convert everything we have into their private property? How do we begin to challenge that and make it clear that that isn't the way it has to be. All of this really depends upon how people think. All of this depends upon how, whether we're talking about members of AFT or we're talking about members of the new Starbucks union, or whether we're talking about people who don't have any unions at all. Starts with people beginning to recognize, first of all, that things don't have to be the way they are. That we don't have to be controlled by the interests of, 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 uh, the, the, of private property. And I'm, I'm done, I think. Can I I'll call on myself? Thank you. Clap, claps. Um, one of the ways that, uh, like, I'm also a, a member of Activate Chicago Parents, and like Kathy, the People's Response Network. And, and I, you know, it, it takes courage to do this, but um, a lot of parents, especially because of the, the inequality and the COVID injustice they were seeing, started uh, running for uh, uh, school councils. Um, and it's good. It's, it's a way of getting a uh, political voice in there, you know, the, uh, to, to represent our students. But my thing is like, okay, so they, they that's great. It's it's one step forward. And at the same time, it's not it's not enough to oppose the budget cuts, you know, and so more needs to happen, more of this unity. Um at one point we had a, a really good event at Orozco High School. Orozco High School used to be amazing for arts, and a quarter of the budget was cut for the school year. What do you think is gonna happen to that school? Predominantly Latino, Latinx school. Um, I, I don't know how they're going to stay open with, with uh, the, those, those cuts. And it, it wasn't the only one, but again, it's another Hispanic school, Latinx school that, that um, just slashing budgets. Um, and uh, um, thank God, you know, they have uh, Alderman Byron Cisco Lopez, who was one of the, one of the 10 um, socialist alder persons that's been elected, which is again, a victory, you know, it's not going to change the entire machine, but we're seeing those kinds of electoral politics happening in Chicago. Uh, and right there, speaking to the people, representing them, you know, and and uh, that's the kind of representation we need from politicians that are gonna promote or or fight for our class interests. You know, today we were going to have Jeanette Taylor. I know she's very busy. I think right now she's at the United Working Families Convention, but she also was instrumental in the hunger strikes and just an amazing advocate and has a, a number of children in the CPS school system. So that, this hits her at the court. You know, somebody from the community who was fighting for for um not just the public school system, but housing that is not, you know, ho housing that's accessible to, to people that need it, you know? So I think, I think that that was one very concrete way where I started to see a lot of parents step up and, and that just got fed up. And Kathy, at one point you were also in the local school council. I don't know if you want to speak to that experience, but uh, I think that that's just one, one way that we can start to have political power. And I'm going to run for LSE when I'm done with this union contract. That's one of the goals but couldn't do it this year, you know? Sita, uh, what did Sita say about parental rights? 
I missed it. Do you want? Do you want to just? Ah. Oh, she says. Uh, see, this says they don't support parent parental rights for parents whose children have a different needs. Oh gosh, don't even get me started on the Sika children from their own children. It's capitalist individualism being used to support the upper class. I, I think absolutely. Um, yep. And Nicole says it's a social construct that doesn't have to be this way. Um, absolutely. Anybody else want to chime in or work you've done with uh, grassroots or ideas you have about how how we can um, cr create systems we need, you know? Uh, Anastasia, go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry, I was just gonna sit and listen <laughs> and just kind of, Tuck myself away quietly. I came in a little bit late. Um, you know what? It's, I listen to everybody, and is everybody has great information to share. You know, I'm at a point right now where I've, over the past couple of years, I've kind of had to shut down. Um, but between family deaths, unexpected deaths, um, and not even from COVID, <laughs> you know, um, my family has been restructured. So right now I'm dealing with, um, there's so many systems, systems and size systems. And I literally had a conversation yesterday with one of the parents at my son's school. And she's like, when do we have another, you know, parent advisory council for me? <laughs> I'm like, it's coming soon because I'm the chairperson. And I, we just had a long discussion about all the things in the communities that's going on. And I'll be honest with you, I am so tired. Um, and not that I'm going to give up because of, of fighting, but I'm fighting all the time. I have to, every time before school starts, I find myself gearing up for a fight. Because it's, and it's not always just, this, it's, it's a combination of Chicago public schools. And sometimes it's the people that work there. So it's just like, you know, the luck of a draw, you call customer, you know, with customer service, <laughs> which I have over 30 years experience of with um, AT&T and other companies. You never know who you want to get. You may get one representative that knows a lot, who's very helpful, and you may get someone who want to just get, get you off the phone and, and not help. So it's, it's, it's the same thing with um, education now here. You never know if you're going to get someone who's going to really care about your child or that cares about um, the system or anything else. You just never know. So I'm just at a point right now where it's like, okay, it's really hard to break down some of these systems and I really do think that we just have to create our own, you know, because those are so old. Those systems been in effect for so long on how they do things. Um, these are higher up. Don't forget, you know, we have spiritual wickedness in high places, you know, that call the shots of everything that goes on, you know, on, on the, our level, as far as just parents and um, the education system, you know, they're making decisions they, and it doesn't affect them at all. But they're doing it because, again, we are. it's always money. It's always greed. Greed, money, and like you said, uh, like the poems and everybody said before, no one want to really talk about opposition or oppression or um, system, systemic racism or just all these other issues out here. It's like, which ones do we attack first or more or whatever? It's, it's, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm at a point right now, I just kind of, I'm at a standstill in my life right now where I have to really just sit still and just pray and figure out um, what I need to do because um, it got me to a point I was very stressed, very stressed. It was painful um, seeing some of the injustices going on out here and the things that were happening to people. And it was really like affecting me on a physical level where it was making me literally sick. And I was like, okay, I cannot put all my emotions into it. I'm an empath. I feel things very deeply and picking up different things and the ethers and whatever. And um, like I said, right now, um, I, I'm, I'm going to just sit back and be supportive of whatever every, everyone is doing until it's time for me to step back up and, you know, and, and do whatever's needed because I literally have got drained um, of fighting some of these systems. And it's sad. It really, it just, it's just so sad that people just don't care, you know? Um, so that's where I met with things. But those points, oh my God, 
And those were so powerful. Those poems touched on so many different subjects and so many different things. Um, it, it hit all kind of different points. It's, and again, it goes back to like right now we're talking about education. And I think that's the main thing that um, is the biggest thing as far as education. But there are so many systems to break down is all connected. Um, we, we, we need a reset. I believe we need a whole, <laughs> we need a country reset, a whole reset out here. Um, we need a whole, we need a do over. We really do. These years, two, three years, even before that, we, we need a whole reset. Um, and it's, uh, it's just so much going on out here, you know, and um, that's, I don't have much to say. Like I said, just to the fact that I'm, I'm really um, at, a, at a point where I just really want to make a difference that really makes sense. You know, I don't want to just keep fighting for the same thing and then somebody else come along and it's just shut down again. It's just like doing the work all over again, generation after generation. Like something has to give. We got to do something different that has never been done before. Yeah, so. absolutely, Anastasia. And I feel you, sister. Um, what, I mean, my thing is, how, how can I, how can we support you? You know, especially those of us who, who, who are active in our schools and and have a voice you know um and one of the things that i think is important that uh and i know you all know this especially and and maybe we're not so good at this but one of one of the things that is important is that we practice self-care and i gotta tell you i'm the worst i was telling you i haven't eaten like three days because i mean you know we've been so busy with the contract campaign and i just don't get don't get anyway my point is this we got to take time to take care of ourselves. It's one of the three things that, you know, they teach us in organizing that, you know, they're the, one of the branches is to practice self-care and as much as you can, even if it's an hour for yourself or, you know, I have actually learned to take a day off and the world doesn't fall apart, but I, I'm like many of you, I, I'm burnt out and the fights, the fight is not, it, the, we've got to ramp up for a bigger struggle ahead, you know? So uh, I, I think I, I would be interested not only in supporting you and your efforts, but maybe how can we support each other in a way that's healthy um so so that we don't get burnt out so i was just telling miha on a very subjective level that um that these kinds of events uplift me hearing from you anastasia see, seeing how you're doing you know hearing from all these other uh people that are in the struggle re really just rejuvenates you know um so i i think this has been very good kathy says i have to priority self-care and don't cooperate <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. We love you. Um, yeah, the last food and Ryan says we need a revolution. I think, you know, we need to change the system. It can't help but be, you know, but uh, other other comments or, or um, maybe from some of our students, some of the students present, not to put you on the spot, but I want to hear what your thoughts are. Um, or anybody else who hasn't spoken. <laughs> This is Lou. Go ahead, Lou. Yeah, I'll put uh, Rosemary and Sita on the spot and see whether either one of them want to say something. I, I think Sita is having microphone issues, so she may have to chat uh, out. And I, I did invite Rosemary, but she 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 posted. Um, actually, it was a little bit back. She posted about uh, a couple of events coming up that are really important. And and, and I gotta say, I, I have to uplift the Trinational Convention because. In meeting with those other educators was so empowering and inspirational uh, for me. So she said, uh, CTU is sending 20 members and we are sending five members from UTLA and the San Antonio Alliance are sending two members to the October Trinational Coalition in Defense of Public Education Conference in Oaxaca about organizing with communities for the future of education, a fight that crosses borders. Rosemary, is that uh, uh, going to be a hybrid or is it going to be in person? Um, that's going to be in person, our first one in a long time. Um, We're supposed to have it in the states, but it would take it takes fourteen months at least for uh, someone to get a visa. So yeah. Oh damn! No, no way you can talk them into doing a hybrid. <laughs> We're, gonna, okay. We're trying to set up streaming through um, the Facebook group for the okay. in English, and then one for. Spanish on uh, the Trinational Coalition to Defend Public Education USA. But the person that has the 
that from Canada that did it last time was not available. So we're trying to figure that out. Uh, well, it is, if you can get out to Oaxaca, which has just an amazing, I mean, the teachers in Oaxaca have done a phenomenal job of creating um, a community-based pedagogy and they've created their own textbooks. They don't have standardized testing. It's amazing, a collaborative project that's taken over 12 years, uh, just beautiful. That That's a kind of educational system that I wish we had. Community-based learning um, where the, the students, I mean, just amazing. I just, I love, I just listening to them just inspires me because that's what I wish we had. Um, you know, I, I had a, a, a comrade of mine, his name was Hector. Uh, he used to say that if we really thought, taught critical thinking, our schools, would, our students would be burning the buildings down. <laughs> you know? But I, I think what he's getting at, you know, if we had a, an education that really taught students to think outside the box, they've been seeing things very differently, you know. Yeah, the schools and um, the rural schools in many parts of Mexico are, are totally embedded and part of the community. So, for example, during COVID, a lot of there are plenty of rural teachers that walk several hours every day to get to the school and then walk back. So the ones that were walking up to the remote areas would prepare their um, their lessons and then give it to one of the community leaders so they wouldn't risk infecting um, anybody in that community with COVID. Mishwa Khan, the, the, there's the official teachers union, which is corrupt. And then there's the um, uh, La Sente, which is, or the Coordinadora, which is started out at, as a progressive coalition just like what happened when Red Fred took over. It came from the base, like in West Virginia and like uh, core in Chicago. And um, they wrote their own lessons and were using those and distributing it. And so it's a very different kind of situation. And then in, in Canada, um, <clears throat> there are, you know, they have a lot of struggles like we do, but um and in LA, we, we've got 10 community-based schools that the students really fought for. And Chicago, of course, has been working with the community for years. We um, spent, for, before our strike in um, 2019 and with UTLA, we spent uh, four years organizing with community, you know, reaching out, organizing with the community. And it's essential. I mean, we have thousands of homeless kids in our school system and how we provide for them. And there are issues like that. And then we've got issues like, um, we now give all kids free food. Um, our community colleges, at least one or, you know, are going to be tuition free for a, at least this year. But that was the original plan in California that Regan did in. So it's it's this fight is across all kinds of lines and um, other countries really push the Frarian approach of teaching. And we have, of course, are dealing with fascism, which um, is different than the police repression and the gangs, for example, in Mexico. Uh, two teachers were just disappeared in Mexico uh, on the 20th and we're trying to find them in Michoacan. And uh, the community has gone out and shut down the main highway to make sure that no traffic goes through until the government looks for them. But here, the whole context, I mean, what DeSantis with um, Betsy DeVos's help is putting in this whole fascist kind of education. And we see that across the country. And there's a small um, religious school, Christian school college in um, Michigan, I can't remember the name of it, that's been a base for organizing and educating people uh, about this approach to education, which is basically fascist. And so it's not just the merger of the, of the private, you know, the corporations like Pearson that does all the testing is an international entity that we have to fight internationally, but it's also um, the whole context, you know, we can't teach real history. Um, and one of my daughters is currently teaching uh, combined fourth fifth. She's also still teaching uh, online at the uh, university level. She's fourth fifth um, in the tribal school on the reservation, her reservation. So she's gone back to give back to the community. And then just 
oh my God, the stuff that the, the white teachers in there, how they've worked with the Paiute kids. It's just, so it's just this whole fight. And they don't, they don't have psychologists. What? School psychologists, any of that? I mean, we don't, we used to have them. We don't have them now, and, but they've never had them. So it's this whole way of like teaching analytical thinking instead of to these tests, because, you know, that's, that's the market, that's the money and getting kids a chance, giving them and listening to them a chance to really think and um, begin to connect the dots like we all have to. And it's a question of taking political power. Um, I won't go on anymore, but I'm sure you've been following what's going on in Oakland. We've been, uh, I know there are articles in Rally about that. And we just um, put out a new article three of us wrote called um, Whose Kids Are Kids about the whole fascist attack on education. Rosemary, I think some of the so people here may not be familiar with what's happening in Oakland. Um, I have some of my students here that may not know. Could you just maybe briefly explain what's uh, happening? Um, basically, Oakland um, is largely, uh, there was an industrial base. It's a largely brown and black community um, and has been for years, you know. Um, and it's an, a fair number of indigenous people who were all out of the dislocation, who went out there, people who went out to work during the war. The industrial base is gone. And there's an effort, they have more charter schools than anywhere proportionally. We have the largest number in LA and that we're not completely charter like New Orleans. And they're basically with the real estate, the gentrifiers of uh, order to coming in because these huge real estate conglomerates are going in and of course they want the best land and so there's been a fight to keep the schools going and they've been closing schools left and right and there was and there's the money to keep the schools going but um further up uh on the political chain the the fic mat which is said oh there's no money we have to close these schools down so there's been a real fight um and the real base has been um, uh, teachers in what's called, um, I think it's union, uh, unit six or se seven or five, I can't remember the exact what they call their area, to keep these schools open. And um, it turns out there's been a coalition formed with the Longshoremen, for example, because the guy that, the Port of Oakland, which is, um, huge on the west coast is on separate land they pay one dollar a year to the city of oakland and the, they want to this one developer wants to put a big um stadium on that land which would affect the jobs of the longshoremen and he just coincidentally happens to own the charter school I can't remember which one it is, but it's the same guy. And then he also is the one that owns and is heading up, putting in all these huge um, apartment buildings, which start at like 3000 a month rent. And it's just forcing the old community out. And there was one school um, that was occupied all summer um, by the community, by people from all over. Uh, a large number of people from the trans community were involved. And they kept that going. And then the district sent in their goons and um, beat people up. And um, so there's a case going on about that. And so there's a big fight now over getting some decent school board members elected. And they redistricted the, um, the school, what do you call it? The school board district so that one progressive guy that's been in there now is going to have to campaign because he is now living in a different area, according to them. So it's this huge battle and it's like, okay, what is the next step? And then it's beginning, oh, wait, we've got complicit people higher up. And gee, why isn't the governor responding to any of this? So people are beginning to see it's this whole system. So it's a huge battle. There is one person from Oakland going to the Trinational too, but it's just been this huge battle of forcing kids and families out that have been there for, you know, one school that's 150 years old and the community have been there for, for generations. And all of a sudden they're being uprooted. 
So that's what's been going on in Oakland. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I, I did have a follow-up question just because I'm curious and, and um, you were part of the process. When, when it came to building these community-based schools, how, 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 what kind, how did you connect with people in the community? Like, what was that process like? Um, well, it was really reorganizing at the, um, at the school level and having people assigned to work with the community and go out and work with them so that you don't just have one union rep at the, at the school site, you have like a collective. And also working very much with students, we have some very um, empowered student organizations in LA and working together. And the students have really been the leading force behind it, of course, backed by our union. And our um, theme for this year in, in UTLA is beyond recovery developing education for beyond recovery. And it's been a question of all these different issues. I mean, we've got so many homeless kids. We we did um, just the beginning of 2020, we had a, a webinar for our, um, in LA about homelessness in the schools. And then you get into the job question and then the pollution question. and. So it's really working with the community. And in, uh, for example, down in um, the port area there, we work pretty tightly with the longshore people. Um, and that's a, it's not as militant a longshore local as the Bay area, but the, you know, when we're on strike, they're on that picket line with us. And years ago when I organized the Tri-National, um, they donated $3,000 for us to hold that international conference in LA. So it's a solidarity across different lines and you know, just getting the help for kids that need food. We, we've fed millions of meals throughout the worst part of COVID. We're giving out free at the schools every day. People could drive in and pick them up. And if people came in that weren't connected with the schools, but they're willing to wait in the line that long to get food, they got food too. So it's making those connections with the community. And the whole idea is to have wraparound services, but we don't have enough um, counselors. We don't have enough psychologists that even though we won those demands in our strike, there's no way to put them in it at this point. Yeah. It's the same thing with the Chicago Teachers Union. I mean, they yeah. want some great things, but we don't have counselors. And we're lucky to have a counselor, but even then, the ratio of students to the one counselor is just oh, outrageous. but she's so good natured and you know I mean I know she was really busy during COVID the students especially because students kept coming asking me for example my, when during the pandemic my son's class had a quarantine six times you don't think that stresses kids out and that that's not even a loss of a parent or a father or you know a, a grandparent um, a lot of our students lost parents and, and needed the counseling support mm -hmm. you know, and they didn't get it so now we see kids acting out and they see more incidents of fighting and whatnot. Why? I don't blame the kids. I just think they're freaking stressed out, you know? Yeah. And, and um, I mean, and probably just grieving and they haven't ha been able to process all that, you know? So I, I think that's so inspiring, the Rosemary. Um, the thing about the unions, though, the, the one thing they do have is they have a 24-hour staff and they have money. And even our, our local Chicago Teachers Union, I mean, the Kukani College Teachers Union, one of the things they they've been they do is that they give money to organizations, you know, they give money mm -hmm. to politicians mm -hmm. that are uh, socialist yeah. or world leading or union supporting. Yeah. But we, we haven't done what you've done, and I think that's so crucial. You know, um, you can't just have a pol or a proposal with a partner school and not connect with the school. You know, <laughs> so connect with the community. Uh, but that that I think is really great. Does anybody else have a comment or question? Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I'm so glad you're going to the Trinational. You can tell me how it goes. Uh, well, this time later, I'll tell you about West Virginia and the other stuff. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sita says, I'm off for another meeting. Thanks for all the updates, however difficult the circumstances are. Thank you, Sita. Thank you for joining. Have fun at your other Saturday meeting. Um, Eric, do you want to do your bit? I, we're, we're like five till or six till three. This has been a really great conversation. Thank you for everybody for contributing. And I agree. Kathy says uh, it can be done. 
you know i agree 100 percent yeah um so i was gonna start my closing by performing a poem um give like a this is a poem by a guy named uh Suli breaks and um it's called why i hate school but love education now i don't totally i'll say i don't totally agree with everything he says but i do think his poem does a wonderful job of kind of you know kind of explaining why our educational system is such a failure because it doesn't really you know our your, our educational system isn't designed to develop your mind it's designed to just um you know shove you into their their box that they want you to be in like prison or wherever so this is why i hate school but love education so you want to get a degree why let me tell you what society will tell you it increases your chances of getting a job provides you with an opportunity to be successful your life will be a lot less stressful education is the key sorry i'm not in front of my camera very well here is that better everyone you look great okay thanks um now let me tell you what your parents will tell you make me proud it increases your chances of getting a job provides you with an opportunity to be successful your life will be a lot less stressful education is the key now let's look at the statistics steve jobs net worth 7 billion rip richard branson net worth 4.2 billion oprah winfrey net worth 2.7 billion mark zuckerberg henry ford steven spielberg bill gates here comes the coop the grace looking at these individuals what is your conclusion neither of them in being successful ever graduated from a higher learning institution now some of you will protest like you know only money is the medium by which one measures worldly success and some of you will even have the nerve to say i don't do it for the money so what are you studying for to work for a charity need more clarity let's look at the statistics jesus mohammed socrates Malcolm X, Mother Teresa, Spielberg, Shakespeare, Beethoven, Jesse Owens, Muhammad Ali, Sean Carter, Michael Jeffrey Jordan, Michael Joseph Jackson. Were either of these people unsuccessful or uneducated? All I'm saying is that if there was a family tree, hard work and education would be related, but school would be a distant cousin as if education is the key and school is the lock because it rarely ever develops your mind to the point where it can preserve red as green and continue to go when someone else says stop because as long as you follow the rules and pass the exams you're cool but are you aware that examiners have a checklist and if your answer is something outside of the box the automatic response is across and then they claim that school expands your horizons and your visions. Well, tell that to Malcolm X, who dropped out of school and is world renowned for what he learned in a prison. Proverbs 17, 16. It does a fool no good to spend money on an education. Why? Because he has no common sense. George Bush, need I say more? Education is about inspiring one's mind, not just filling their head. And take this from me, because I'm an educated man myself, who only came to this realization after countless nights in the library with a can of Red Bull, keeping me awake till, da till dawn and another can in the morn, falling asleep in between piles of books, which probably equated to the same amount I had spent on my rent. Memorize equations, facts, and dates right down to the letter half of which I would never remember and half of which I would forget straight after the exam and before the start of the next semester, asking anyone if they had notes for the last lecture. I often found myself running to class just so I could find a spot of which I could rest my head and fall asleep without making a scene. Ironic because that's the only time I ever spent in university chasing my dreams. 
And then after nights with a dead mind, I then find myself in a queue of half awake student zombies waiting to hand in an, hand in an assignment. Maybe that's why they called it a deadline. And then after three years of mental suppression and frustration, my proud mother didn't even turn up to my graduation. Now I'm not saying that school is evil and there's nothing to gain. All I'm saying is understand your motives and reassess your aims. Because if you want a job working for someone else, then help yourself. But then that would be a contradiction because you wouldn't really be helping yourself. You'd be helping somebody else. There's a saying which says, if you don't build your dream, someone else will hire you to build theirs. Redefine how you view education. Understand its true meaning. Education is not just about regurgitating facts from a book on someone else's opinion on a subject to pass an exam. Look at it. Picasso was educated in creating art. Shakespeare was educated in the art of all that was written. Colonel Harlan Sanders was educated in the art of creating Kentucky Fried Chicken. I once saw David Beckham take a free kick. I watched as the side of his Adidas-sponsored boot, boot hit the leather of the ball at an angle, which caused it to travel toward the skies as, it was as if it was destined for the heavens. And then as it reached the peak of its momentum, as though it changed its mind, it switched direction. I watched as the goalkeeper froze, as though he recited to himself the law of physics, and as though his brain was negotiating with his eyes that it was indeed witnessing the spectacle of the leather swan that was coming towards him, and then reacted. But only a fraction of a millisecond too late. And the country that I live in erupted into cheers. I looked at the play and thought, damn. Looking at David Beckham, I thought, damn. There's more than one way to be an educated man. Um, so, yeah, that poem I, I thought was like, you know, our education system isn't doing a good job of, uh, of living up to its potential. We're not, no matter what kind of education you get in this country today or in a lot of places around the world, you're not going to get the kind of that you need to be, we need to totally redefine it, restructure the system. Um, anyway, thank you all for coming to um, the league. Uh, this event was sponsored by the League of Revolutionaries for a New America. And um, to kind of give you an idea of what the league is, I will read to you from our program here, just a paragraph. Um, our country and the world stand at a crossroads. Humanity has the potential for economic security and abundance. A community of the people, by the people, and for the people, where children can grow in peace, is possible as never before. Or if we do nothing, we face increasingly unlivable conditions caused by private ownership of the wealth that human labor has created. The purpose of the League of Revolutionaries for a New America is to build consciousness and unity among the most impacted workers to be able to secure the needs of humanity and avoid the destitution and environmental disaster threatening life on our planet as we know it. Um, and if you want to read our whole program, you can do that at learna.org, which is just uh, www.lrna.org. And on our site there, on the right hand side, you'll see uh, we have a list, you know, we have a list of recent posts and uh, there, there are some events there that are coming up. Um, October 15th, Saturday from 11 a.m. to 1, to 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific time is uh, taking power to create the future, uh, a conversation with and for revolutionaries, our bodies, our lives, our planet. Um, and on Saturday, October 22nd, we have building the progressive tidal wave in the 2022 elections, um, a dialogue for revolutionaries. And, you know, that will go over kind of what to expect from the upcoming uh, midterm elections and 
how best to, to work around that and such. Uh, and then on the 29th of October, we'll have uh, an event for those in Illinois, specifically um, regarding the midterm elections. So, um, so yeah, our website, learner.org. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, uh, Twitter. I put all that, all those links in the in the uh, chat because there's so many of them. Uh, but you can also find them on our website. So thank you. Yeah. And if anybody else has other events or other upcoming uh, that we can uh, organize, help organize, not help organize, but support, I guess we could organize, I don't know. Any, any other events coming up in your area? All right, well, Thank you, everyone. We appreciate all of your uh, staying the whole time. I know two hours is a long time on a Saturday, but appreciate the conversation and solidarity and let's keep it going. Uh, one of the things we want to do is to continue to network and unite with all of you. And so let's, let's maybe talk about how we can do that. Yes, yeah, you soon at Harold Washington. Um, I think I pitched this early. We have a, a elected school board, not elected school board, pardon me. We have a, a huge, um, action at this on uh, October 6th at 1.30 at 30 East Lake Street. We're asking for support for our negotiations because the city is not negotiating with us. So we'd love to have you there. We're gonna pick it outside the school and then we're also going to have people come to the board meeting wearing red. So that's uh, October, October 6th on a Thursday at 30 East Lake Street in Chicago. Everybody's welcome, even students, tell your friends. Um, sorry, I can't type. A anybody else? All right. Well, thank you again. I hope to see you soon at these events and hope to stay in touch so we can continue to unite around these critical issues. Come all you good people, good news to you I'll tell of how the revolution will make heaven out of hell. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? How many lives we say That we all fought for something more than to keep on being slaves Now tell me which side are you on? Which side are you on, mother trucker? Which side are you on? Which side are you on? And the statue of Columbus Downtown on Columbus Drive Cops beat and tear gas us protecting that monument to genocide Now which side are you on? 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 Which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? We're from the freedom side! Which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? We're from the freedom side! Poverty, why would we need police when food is scarce? Prisons are plenty, but without justice, there's no peace. Now, which side are you on? 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 Tell me, which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? We're on the freedom side. Which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? We're on the freedom side!